In our next session, I get to sit down with Selena Ahmed, who is the Global Director of the Periodic Table of Food Initiative uh, at the American Heart Association. Give her a round of applause. Thank you for being here. It's great to see you. Danny, it's so great to see you. And as, as I was coming to this event and telling my daughter where I was going, um, saying it was World Food Day, and she's like, but we eat food every day. Shouldn't every day be World Food Day? Um, and I was thinking, absolutely, those of us who work in food systems, it is. But you, Danny, more than anybody else I know, and your team at Food Tank really celebrate World Food Day every single day with the connections that you build, the awareness, and the solutions and the hope that you give globally. So such an honor to be here with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. All right, so the Periodic Table of Food Initiative sounds very complex and very scary. Tell us what it is. It is indeed very complex. It's not scary, though. <laughs> uh, the Periodic Table of Food Initiative has a North Star that many of us, I think, have, which is how do we achieve healthy diets from sustainable food systems for all? And the way that we're doing that is in a very complex way, and hopefully we will ultimately translate it in ways that are simple. The way that we're doing that is by measuring food the way we measure medicine. And so for lots of history, we have had a really close relationship with food as medicine. In really the 20th and 21st century, that relationship shifted in many communities. And the way we measure food really has had a standstill the way it was in the 1950s. Yeah. We're still really measuring food the way we did in the 1950s with a limited knowledge of a handful of nutrients, really focusing our entire food system on those nutrients on yield. But food is far more complex, far more diverse than that. Um, and what we're doing is elucidating that, really utilizing those tools, those multi-omics tools that have been utilized in medicine and now applying it to understand our food. So yes, we have a very basic question we ask, which is, what is in our food? It's 2025, and we're still trying to figure that out. Very simple question. The second question is, how does that vary based on how food is grown? So we've heard some beautiful agricultural practices being celebrated today. One of the questions that we're asked the most is, does organic food or regenerative agriculture result in more nutrient-dense foods? We're answering that question through these standardized tools that we've developed. And then the third question is, does it matter for human health? So the same multi-omics tools that we've developed for understanding what is in our food, we've also standardized for looking at human serum as well as fecal matter. So we can have food, nutrition, and clinical interventions that make those linkages between food as well as human health. And we can also apply them to looking at the soil microbiome so then we can make those connections from farm to food to blood. It's really, it's so interesting and so cool. And, and uh, Food Tank got to be at the launch of the Periodic Table of Food Initiative. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit since that launch about a year and a half ago, how the PTFI, as it's known, it has evolved. Yeah, absolutely. So for the first four years of our initiative, we were just developing these multi-omics tools, the metabolomics tools to look at the 27,000 bioactive components that have anti-inflammatory properties, the 3,000 lipid species that have different um, health impacts for our metabolism, looking at the 60 different unique fiber components that each have a different function in our body. So we had developed those tools and we had started applying them for an initial data set of commonly consumed foods. Since then, we have grown the ability for labs around the world to utilize and onboard those tools. So really understanding local food systems globally. Mm -hmm. And our goal by 2030 is to be participating, collaborating, with 100 labs to really build this knowledge of underutilized crops of their local food systems. Data, as I was mentioned before uh, by Dr. Merrigan, is just part of the equation. It's only so far that data can go. And so what we've really done in the past year and a half is think, how do we take this very complex data and begin to actually apply it for those hopeful solutions that Food Tank one day will celebrate? <laughs> um, and one of those is through collaboration and through partnership. So one of the initiatives that, and collaborations that I'm so excited that we're working with is with Alameda County's Recipes for Health program. It's a food is medicine intervention 
where we are co-creating a food quality framework for seeing how do growing practices impact the quality, the nutrient density, as well as diversity of produce prescription programs um, and what are the implications for human health. And so not just treating all apples the same, but really saying their growing practices impact that biomolecular composition. And we hear a lot about nutrient density. Mm -hmm. I also want to elevate the concept of nutrient diversity and biomolecular diversity. We know that biodiversity is so fundamental for planetary health. And often when we're thinking about food, we forget about that. But with the Sustainable Development Goals, dietary diversity has really been celebrated as a key component of dietary quality. And now we have this opportunity to see how this biomolecular diversity that is linked to the diversity of the soil organic matter actually can upregulate that diversity and feed our gut microbiome. So I'm really excited for those practical applications and collaborations that we're ha having. Another big um, sort of tool that we're working on to translate this biomolecular data is a platform called Swap It Smart. We've just started building it. Um, it takes all of this complex data, integrates it with sensors, sensory data, ecological data, footprint, uh, ecological footprint data, cost data, um, and then the goal is to collaborate with school meals, chefs, um, as well as food enterprises to design foods that are healthier and really have those functional attributes for all. And so really going back to the root of food is medicine, where food was nourishing, how do we bring that back and design foods? for those health attributes. It, it's so exciting, and you've talked about nutrient diversity and biomolecular diversity. One of the things I appreciate most about the PTFI is the diversity of thought and, and leadership and how you're democratizing research really across the globe. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So human capacity and capacity strengthening is really core to our model. We are really developing the tools and then providing them open access along with the data, as well as open access training to build capacity globally and really have that partnership. So we have presence with laboratories and institutions on each continent um, and really supporting and building the capacity of those scientists, um, as well as practitioners to generate this knowledge, integrate it with other ways of knowing, including ancestral wisdom, mm -hmm. um, to really bring solutions that are place-based and culturally relevant. Absolutely. And I feel like there's also so much potential over the, for the PTFI to change farming practices, to help encourage more sustainable, more resilient farming practices. Yeah, absolutely. So as I was saying, one of the key questions that we're asked is, does regenerative agriculture, does organic agriculture or agroforestry result in more nutrient-dense foods? And how do we actually build that evidence? Scientifically, so many of the studies that have been done around the world use different methodology, so we can't actually harmonize that data, and so we don't have evidence at scale. So by having that standardized methodology that we've developed, we can actually now begin to integrate that data and have evidence and scale so we can really answer that question. And the data that we are seeing, the learnings from the different partners that we work with, is that it really depends based on geography, on based on growing practice, um, based on the specific crop. Um, and so there's so many complex variables to bring in um, as we're really beginning to understand. But um, we're also starting to work in thinking about how do we use this knowledge for crop breeding. Mm -hmm. So all the way upstream, we can think about how, choosing the seeds that are the most nutrient dense, that have that greatest nourishment, um, and then designing the farming practices around that. And there's certain farming practices we can also begin to test. So some might be more laborious, but actually result in really high nutrient density, and others might be also very laborious, but might not be making as much of a difference. Right. Um, in addition to the good things that we're measuring in food, we're also measuring the bad things, right. the toxins, the heavy metals. Um, and so I think there's tremendous opportunity to really elucidate that knowledge of uh, and really cleaning up our food supply so it is healing. Sure. Selena, when you're talking about the PTFI and all the research that's being done and that needs to be done, I'm wondering how you include or can you include farmers and food producers from the beginning of this research so they don't feel like they're just recipients but they feel like partners. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we have um, 13 different uh, partner labs and centers of excellence and 25 different institutions. And we really rely on those partners to build and carry out community-based research projects. We also support almost 40 good food fellows around the world. Um, and each of them are carrying out place-based, community-based research um, in their communities collaborating with farmers. We also are very open to folks who want to directly work with us. And so we do have some research studies that we also directly lead um, and also just analyzing, uh, analyzing foods. And so if folks want to know, I have this, I have this, and I have this, and I've grown it in different ways, is it resulting in a signal in terms of uh, nutrient diversity? We're really happy to have those conversations. Oh, that's great. That's great. That's really democratization at its best in science. Um, one of the things that we, when we last spoke, you mentioned is the food and intelligence economy. What is that? The food intelligence economy is really going back to that concept where food is medicine and we have that deep relationship to food that's healing. Right now, we just don't even, we don't even have that basic intelligence of food. And so it's really building that intelligence of food where it becomes common knowledge, even for my six-year-old daughter, that she just has that intelligence. And the economy part is where the decision-making now is centered around that food intelligence. And so the economy part is really bringing some economic value and decision making to that basic knowledge. And this is a world where we're seeing a lot less diet related chronic disease, a world where farmers are given price premiums for their growing practices, that they have incentive to grow nourishing foods in nourishing ways. Yeah, it's such a great concept. I also want you to, to talk a little bit about Food EDU on the PTF website and why, you know, what resources are available to folks. Absolutely. So uh, we have a few exciting things happening at the Periodic Tables of Food Initiative. We just announced a data visualization challenge to reimagine the future of the nutrition and food fact labels and labeling. Um, and there is up to, I think, forty or $50,000 of cash prizes. And so you can go to the American Heart Association's web, uh, website, and we have a press release on that. So if you want to explore the data and think about how this can really uh, change the way we, as consumers and as food systems, do stewards understand food um, and kind of reimagine that. So there's a, a prize for that. Also, we have our Food EDU platform, which is open access. Right now, we have a course uh, that's called Food Omics and Society, and it provides the sort of groundwork on why is it important to understand food? How does this knowledge complement other ways of knowing, including traditional indigenous knowledge? Um, and what are the societal applications for this type of knowledge towards building a food intelligence? intelligence economy. And so we do have that open access um, and encourage everybody to explore that. Um, right now, the data that we have available on our website is uh, both discovery data as well as foundational data on what is in food. So we can look at the foods that we, the delicious and nourishing foods that we consumed um, at lunch today. And we can say, we can understand what are the, the diverse fiber components in the lentils that we consume that are actually feeding our gut microbiome. So you can explore your favorite foods um, and really build, start building your knowledge for, um, for food right today by exploring our open access database. Awesome. Because we are on a college campus and we have a lot of young academics and scholars and, and um, one of Selena is probably in the room, what advice do you have the, to, to them to get involved in our food and agriculture systems in all kinds of different ways like you have? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the core is always, um, with all of this different knowledge, it's always really to follow your bliss, to follow your heart, um, and to always foster unconventional paths, um, as well as collaborations. And I think, you know, Danny, you do such a remarkable, inspiring job of bringing diverse partners together and those diverse perspectives. Um, I was a university professor also at Montana State University uh, for 10 years in sustainable food systems. And I always encourage my graduate students to really create create their own path, even if it doesn't exist. And so I had gotten my undergraduate degree in biology. I then had a master's degree in ethnobotany. I then had my PhD in biology, had my postdoc training in biomedical sciences. And then I put it all together as a professor of sustainable food systems, because all those elements, the ecological, the cultural, the health really contribute to looking at sustainability in a really holistic way. But along the way, I did hear from lots of people, what are you doing? This is quite an 
unconventional path, these dots don't connect. But in our systems approach, they connect really beautifully. Absolutely. It was the best path for you to go on. I love it. Um, I want to end with something, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we started out this event today talking about the uncertainty in the world and, and how dire you know, everything seems, but there is so much hope. You're finding hope. People in this room are finding hope. Do you have a call to action you want to leave people with? Yeah, so I think um, the call to action, first of all, is to take action um, and really let's rebuild our relationship with food. Let's each really commit to treating food like medicine. Um, and let's do that collaboratively in partnership. Um, I really like that you were saying how we listen, have to listen to people that we typically didn't like to listen to. I think it's so important to have those unconventional partnerships, even with people who you think are institutions um, or sectors that you you think are the problem. I think that's so, so important. Um, and then as we move forward, it is so critical that we move forward with humanity in a world that is so increasingly being dominated um, by artificial intelligence, which I'm also collaborating on. We really have to find, um, I think, our path forward through being human. Yeah, find the humanity. I always learn so much from you, Selena. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Round of applause. Thank you so much.